So Pao Kun, like uh, Lu Sun, uh, wrote about the stories of ordinary people. You remember social realism? The, go to the ordinary people, write uh, stories that are ordinary. And, uh, one, and the, the most, one of his still most famous plays is The Coffin is Too Big for the Hole. And it is about an everyday man, an every man, the character who comes to bury his grandfather uh, in, in, in the cemetery. And I think Hero is going to read this for us, and he's going to sort of round and bully you all. Okay, go. We were all at the cemetery. All my folks, my wife, my kids, my brothers, my sisters, my cousins, and their kids. There were so many people at the cemetery that didn't even know for sure who was a relative and who wasn't. But the coffin was too big. It was so big that we had to hire 16 coolies to carry it from the funeral coach to the grave. That coffin was so damn heavy that the 16 of them nearly dropped it to the ground. And we, the men from the family, had to rush over to save it. Now, you don't want the coffin to crash down. I'm sure you all understand that, right? What if the thing busted open right there? In front of all the people? But the problem was not so much that it was too big. Sorry, I meant too heavy. The coffin was too big that it couldn't fit into the hole. So I called the funeral parlor man over. Hey, how come the hole is so small? Sorry, uh, sir. The, it's not the hole too small. It's the coffin too big. My God, I was furious. I said, Okay, then you go and get me another plot. I'm afraid can't last, sir. Regulations say one dead is allotted one plot. How can you have two graves for one coffin? Who said anything about two graves? One man, one body, one coffin, one grave. Only double the size. It's not allowed, uh, sir, you see. All the other graves in the cemetery, see, rows upon rows upon rows of graves, as far as your eyes can see, all same size. Do you see any one of them sitting on two plots? No two graves for one person. Everyone's standard size. No room for exception. You know! This is my grandfather getting buried. This, huh, is not the bottling of soya sauce. It's not the canning of pineapple cubes. It's not the laying of bricks at HDB flats. It's not the drawing of lines on a parking lot. And yep, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much. 1984, he writes, uh, The Coffin is Too Big for the Hole. In 1986, he writes, No Parking on Odd Days. So No Parking on Odd Days is about this fellow who has a habit of collecting parking tickets, meaning he park, anything he park, anywhere he parks, he's going to get booked. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, and I felt knowing Pao Kun, having had the pleasure of knowing him, uh, that a lot of it was uh, autobiographical in the case, because he also was collecting a whole lot of uh, parking tickets. I don't know whether Jen Hong knows this, but your father didn't dare to drive, do you know that? So don't forget he was writing in English. Now, English was the communist called the language of the enemy. You know, that is the language of the colonial masters, you know or not? Ah. You think what, you know, the, the British came and ruled you. Uh, if you cannot speak English, you cannot get a job. You know or not? Yeah? Because you know, uh, they only had, anyway, education in English, the, the British. So, Pao Kun wrote in English. Before that, Pao Kun did not write in English. So, you can say that Pao Kun used the Pai Hua of that time. Yeah? Because of, of, of English being the main language of education, Chinese uh, audiences chi in Chinese uh, plays began to fall. Now, it's very, very important when you talk about Pao Kun's plays that is that when he wrote the English plays, he wrote the English plays. When he wrote the Chinese plays, he wrote the Chinese plays. What do I mean? Uh, they are not translations. He wrote them individually. So they didn't have to be exactly word for word the same. It's very, very important. Remember, we talked about the, the translation of Nahan. Is it called Outcry or is it cheering at the sidelines, it makes a lot of difference when you do translation. 
And this fellow, uh, he was a Hong Kong professor at that time, uh, Lee Tong Ki, and then he looked at the Chinese version and he said the Chinese version was very heterolingual. It had a lot of insertions of English. Right? So, like, for example, you know, we spoke in Malay, most of us would sort of squeeze in a few words of English. So, he said uh, that showed that the English was hegemonic. So, this is another, uh, uh, another analysis, not Lee Tong Ki. Uh, the, the son tells the father to go and fight. Alama, you know, you, you get the, the kapak, then go and fight, lah. go and fight, why cannot? And then the father said, damn it, you know, okay, lah, you can read it for a second, going fast, fast. And then the father speaks to the magistrate in what? Good English. Yeah, before that, damn it, man. You know, you know wow, look, boy only nine years old, already so, boy only nine, already so observant. You don't say boy only nine, that's not good English, lo. My son is only f nine years old, that's good English, yeah? So, even just saying, I should, man. You know, so he was using that kind of language, but when he speaks to the magistrate, it's all poshy English. Correct or not? So, this is a fellow called Son Andre. It's not a good old Lee Tongki we left him behind. They said, number one, the father can switch between formal English and Singlish. Marks him off as Singaporean. Chik, boleh, right now, we all can switch. Am I correct? Second one, boy Singlish limited register marks him as the uneducated youth who will make up the next generation. I say, eh? <laughs> Where did that come from? This is Angmo writing about us. I said, what? what, 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 what? Meaning all you younger fellows, I'm old already, so it's all right, all you younger blokes, can only speak in, in, in Singlish. Therefore, you are an educated youth of the next generation. God help us all. <coughs> and generally, the man's and his son's use of Singlish, in effect, is a sign of their lack of power. Eh? Hello? Where, where, where did that come from? In the Mandarin version, besides allowing us to identify with the man as a single one, blah, 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 you know, and shows that English is the language of power and law. Where did all that come from? <coughs> when you read the, the actual article, you say, hey, very funny, you know. It's my proposition that Pao Kun completely uh, celebrated the mixture of languages because he had open culture. He's one of his manifestos. Uh, he was an idealist. He believes that all Singapore students should be exposed to different, different cultures. You know the Aneke Ragam Rakyat? Rakyat no, Rakyat. Aneke Ragam means variety show, Rakyat, people. Then after, wah, oh, see, wah, oh, Malay fellow go dung 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 Then the next thing, Chinese come, wah, oh, ribbin, ribbin, ribbin. And after that, Indian dung 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 That was what it was, Aneke Ragam Rakyat, because we were unity, you know? So their first shows in the 1960, 1965 was, I wrote here, Flower, Youth and Sea. It was a medley of three individual dance dramas featuring dancers in multi-ethnic costumes. He looked very, very carefully. You can see one Malay bloke at the back, I think. And, <laughs> and uh, Chinese, Malay and Indian dance idioms within the overall ballet choreography because Daekwon is a ballerina. Uh, and Daekwon had to say, when we first came back, we were proactive in working with Malays and Indians to have a basic understanding of each other's culture. This will create mutual understanding. Today, our basic is we all like laksa and cha kway tiao. Uh, so, a very sweet way of saying it, but uh, the, the fact that we are culturally uh, desert. You know, you know, you say Singapore cultural desert? No, you know, so we ourselves are desert. Desert, no culture. 